This video is brought to you in part by GOG.com. Welcome back everybody, I'm Nick930, and today I wanted to share with you the complete history of The Witcher. The Witcher is a third-person fantasy role-playing video game series, developed by CD Projekt Red and based strongly off the writings of fantasy writer Andrzej Sapkowski. In each game, players assume the role of monster hunter Geralt of Rivia, whose mutated genome grants him the unnatural abilities and skills to deal with the world's most dangerous monsters. The game series is best known for its incredibly immersive fantasy experience with a complex web of narrative plot threads and groundbreaking visual effects, and it's amassed a huge fanbase over the course of the past decade, along with a significant evolution of both its graphics and its gameplay mechanics since its initial 2007 debut, with the most recent entry being praised for revolutionizing the single-player RPG, while simultaneously transforming the largely unknown Polish studio into a tour de force across the industry worldwide. So how exactly did this series become such a dominant force in the gaming medium? And what about it is so special? Well, to answer that properly, we need to first understand what inspired its original creator back in the 1980s. In 1986, 38-year-old Polish writer Andrzej Sapkowski submitted a fictional short story for a writing competition in a fantasy magazine. The submission, titled Viedgman, or The Witcher, told the story of a brooding mercenary named Geralt, who visits the kingdom of Azima and is contracted to slay a deadly creature called Astriga. Despite its potential, the story only managed to earn the third place prize, but this didn't dissuade its author from writing more. Heavily influenced by the work of Tolkien and many other well-known 20th century fantasy writers, Sapkowski continued to expand upon the world he had created, introducing new reoccurring characters, more nuance, and effectively establishing something very unique. The themes he explored in his writing didn't necessarily revolve around traditional fantasy tropes like good versus evil, but instead established a more gray area, challenging readers with more realistic situations and often unsettling outcomes. These novels continued to release all throughout the 90s, with the final entry to the Witcher saga releasing in Poland in 1999, laying the groundwork for future interpretations. By now, the series had become a phenomenon throughout Poland. It was an absolutely massive success, as its thematic elements resonated well with Polish society. And with the video game medium similarly growing more popular around the world, it was only a matter of time before job postings appeared for a Witcher video game adaptation. The first attempt to create a Witcher video game was not actually CD Projekt Red. It was, in fact, from a very small company called Metropolis Software House, who had planned an ambitious action RPG interpretation of the game, intended for Sony's original PlayStation console. This game was eventually cancelled, but had it actually come to fruition, it would have featured a similar design to Capcom's Resident Evil games, with lots of static backgrounds and 3D polygonal character models running in and out of the screen. When faced with a threat, the game would then switch to an alternate combat mode, with a sort of early take on quick-time events to determine a player's success when striking or blocking attacks. This inevitably proved to be too ambitious for the understaffed studio at Metropolis, and the project was canned soon after, leaving the license to the Witcher IP available for anyone willing to purchase it. Meanwhile, over in Warsaw, two young high school students, Marcin Nowinski and Michael Kaczynski, sought to break into the booming Polish market of the 1990s. For those of you that don't know, Poland's economy had been largely restricted due to the Soviet Union's control post-World War II. This greatly limited trade with Western powers, and kept things like movies and video games from being traded with the country. This stunt in their economic growth eventually resulted in the formation of the independent trade union called Solidarity in the early 1980s, and in 1989, Poland finally was able to transition to liberal capitalism, opening new channels of trade with Western countries that were previously restricted. 
both Marchin and McCall, who were big fans of the emerging video game medium, decided to take advantage of this new opportunity, and began to import Western video games in bulk, and sold them at the Warsaw Computer Bazaar on Grzybowska Street. It seemed like the easiest way to play the latest game sooner, but it soon dawned on the pair that this business could make them quite a bit of money too. By the mid-90s, the duo began to expand, establishing the company name CD Project Group, as a reference to the CD-ROMs that they were flipping. The business performed extremely well, with a steady line of customers every day eager to play the newest Western video games. But one issue continued to persist. The games were not localized. Many couldn't even read the packaging. CD Projekt, aware of this disconnect, then entered a new phase of their business, and began to offer Polish versions of Western box art and game manuals, and even hired Polish actors to dub over the English voice acting. Będzie zrobione. Powinienem był zaciągnąć się do wojska. By the end of the 90s, CD Projekt maintained a reliable stream of revenue, along with some solid connections in the industry overseas, most notably Interplay Entertainment and BioWare. In 1999, they were offered their first official localization project, Baldur's Gate, that went on to sell well over 100,000 copies, far more than anything that they had sold in the past making them a major player within the Polish video game distribution market. And what's more, it allowed the studio to finally transition to a more legitimate and sustainable business model. They soon became the go-to Polish video game distributor for many major video game publishers around the globe, and games from studios like Ubisoft and Microsoft saw a huge influx of Polish gamers in their online lobbies as a result. At the start of the new millennium, CD Projekt opened their first software development studio, CD Projekt Red, and were hired to work on a PC port of the next Baldur's Gate game, Dark Alliance. But as the game's publisher, Interplay, started to face major financial difficulties, it became clear that the project would soon be a dead end, and they were forced to cancel production. This put CD Projekt in an uncomfortable position. They had just spent six months on the project, and were left completely blindsided. But rather than just chalking it up as a loss, the team decided to scavenge what they could, and build their very own game from scratch. They tossed around a few ideas, many inspired by old tabletop games, but they soon landed on the hugely popular Polish fantasy stories by Sapkowski, that many within CD Projekt Red were already familiar with having read them recreationally throughout their school years. What cemented this decision was the realization that the licensing for The Witcher had been made available again following the cancellation of Metropolis's attempt and CD Projekt immediately jumped on the opportunity. Now that they had the green light, production began in 2003 within a small two-room office in Lodz, with only a small handful of developers. Early concepts of this new Witcher game were based around the same concepts utilized in Dark Alliance, with an isometric camera view and a focus on dungeon crawling and lots of monster slaying. Players were even given the opportunity to design their own custom character to play through the game with, interacting with NPCs like Geralt throughout the course of the campaign. But the early years of development proved to be extremely difficult, as there were some significant communication barriers between the writing team and the lead programmer Sebastian Zielinski. Sebastian, the original creative director for the project, had insisted on using his own game engine, which had proven effective enough in his previous project, Mortar. But the writing team argued that this engine was insufficient in delivering the sort of narrative branching RPG experience that they intended for The Witcher. They found themselves writing hundreds of pages of the game's script within the game engine itself, just so they can export it and bounce ideas off each other. The situation soon became so unproductive that CD Projekt were forced to intervene, dismissing Sebastian and moving the remainder of the team over to a new office in Warsaw. At this point, progress on the game was minimal, with only three writers and a single programmer working on a remarkably low budget of only $300,000, and now no game engine to build from. After settling into his new Warsaw office, programming lead Zardzianowski suggested that they use the Aurora engine, which he had used previously when working on Neverwinter Nights. CD Projekt, having established a good relationship with Bioware in the past, agreed, and secured the license for a reasonable fee, allowing for development of The Witcher to proceed. But when the programmers received the engine code, they found it was not nearly as easy to work with as they had hoped. Bioware had essentially sent them the entirety of Neverwinter Nights in a deconstructed form, and in order to make it their own, the dev team were forced to rewrite about 90% of it, a long and tedious process that ultimately impacted the scope of the game. The Witcher was first shown behind closed doors at E3 2004, with an early look at the Old Manor Island, a section that players may recognize from the end of the game, 
Based on the demo, many aspects of the dialogue interaction were already in place, and there were even some rough examples of the game's point-and-click combat system as well. The response from the press was generally positive, and the developers took any constructive criticism they could in order to shape their game into something that Western audiences would enjoy. As development continued, the project deadlines began to shape around the E3 showcases. Massive new environments were erected like the Zima outskirts and the city streets to excite the press at events, and it worked as anticipation steadily mounted. But as the game continued to grow, it became clear that the player-made character idea was not delivering the quality of storytelling that they wanted, and as fans of the Witcher books themselves, they decided to change it. The writers completely overhauled the script, making Geralt of Rivia the sole protagonist of the game. This presented a plethora of new problems, as they wanted to avoid retelling Sapowski's stories, but also didn't want to change them either. So they agreed to set the game's plot after the events of the book series, which required a bit of a retcon. To help explain why players were stuck relearning all of Geralt's old abilities, for example, they introduced the concept of amnesia, a fairly cliché band-aid of a fix, but a fix nonetheless. The amnesia idea also allowed players not already familiar with the Witcher series to jump right in and experience it all for the first time, without feeling too lost in its extensive lore. Old characters could be introduced again, new relationships could be forged, and players could be steadily eased into Sapkowski's narrative that would be fully integrated by the third entry. As the writers sculpted this new chapter to the Witcher storyline, the programmers and designers struggled to work with the often rigid engine that was Aurora. It proved difficult to achieve things like large open spaces, so a lot of the code had to be rewritten to take advantage of the project's ambitious new scope. Lines upon lines of script were strewn together, all contributing to the Kingdom of Azima and its surrounding villages' remarkably immersive feel. When designing these areas, the art team took heavy inspiration from things like old Renaissance-era paintings and traditional Slavic culture, and coupled that with a much more grim and realistic art style. One aspect that required a lot of additional effort was the design of the lighting. The Aurora engine by default would not allow for ambient lighting to transition smoothly from day to night. This was obviously problematic for the team, as a lot of the game's quests and NPC pathing is based around the time of day. So, without any type of visual editor, they had to painstakingly reconfigure each light map at every time interval to create the illusion of a flowing time cycle. This was then coupled with a dynamic weather system, that similarly had to have its ambient lighting manually adjusted. Meanwhile, character model creation offered its own set of challenges. The design of many of the characters, especially the female models, were strongly debated over, as many found them to be overly sexualized and unrealistic. But some of the higher-ups within the studio disagreed, arguing that the designs were not only consistent with Sapowski's description of the characters, but also a valuable marketing tool, as they felt a bulk of Western gamers were sex-obsessed young males. The fate of the world is in the balance, and you're thinking about sex? Oh, what the hell. Strip. Then, there was the matter of getting these characters to move and behave believably. At first, they recorded hundreds of animations with a very rudimentary mocap system, with a single actor hooked up to a bunch of cables and wires, greatly restricting his movement. This method was used to record several of the game's final animations, including many of the monsters like the Drowners. But as CD Projekt ramped up production value, they rented a more advanced mocap studio and hired professional swordsmen to help properly capture Geralt's impressive combat maneuvers. This focus on authenticity and attention to detail helped to set the Witcher's medieval world apart from other fantasy RPGs at the time, and when coupled with Sapowski's uniquely dark and grim style, it became clear to audiences everywhere that The Witcher was set to completely transform the genre. Finally, after five years of development and an extended $5.3 million budget, CD Projekt released their first game, The Witcher, exclusively for the PC. The Witcher takes place in the year 1270, in a fictional European-style continent made up of several warring factions, mainly the Northern Kingdoms and the significantly more powerful and wealthy Nilfgaardian Empire. This world also plays host to a large assortment of fantastical elements, as a result of a cataclysmic event known as the Conjunction of Spheres, where the world briefly crossed paths with another dimension, unleashing unusual creatures, monsters, and magic throughout the world. To help combat the more vicious of these new creatures, humans established the Order of the Witchers, a group of knights and mages who were exposed to an extreme level of mutagens, in hopes of making them more physically capable to deal with the new threat. But, because of the high mortality rate when trying to rapidly change human DNA, the program was abandoned, and the few surviving participants split, creating
creating their own independent schools all focused on killing monsters for their own personal monetary gain. The player assumes the role of Geralt of Rivia, a witcher from the School of the Wolf, who wakes up in the middle of the woods with amnesia, mortally wounded and being pursued by an unknown enemy. He's soon saved by other members of his school, and is wheeled off to his home in the northern mountains, Kira Morin. But soon after arriving, the fortress is attacked by a group of bandits, who, with the help of some powerful mages, manage to breach the witcher's secret underground lab, and make off with their powerful mutagens. Battered and beaten, the witchers reconvene to say farewell to the fallen, and agree to venture out across the world to find those responsible. Geralt, having earned favor with its king in the past, is sent to the kingdom of Temeria, where most of the first game's story takes place. But finding these thieves proves to be extremely difficult, as the kingdom of Temeria has its own fair share of problems to deal with, including a pack of ghostly dogs terrorizing the village folk, racial unrest between the city's non-human residents and the religious sect called the Order of the Flaming Rose, and the return of the monstrous Striga that evidently wasn't completely cured the first time. Throughout his journey, Geralt is reunited with several old faces, most notably the dwarf Zoltan, the sorceress and potential major love interest Triss Marigold, and of course the Barb Dandelion, one of Geralt's closest companions. Geralt is experiencing cognitive dissonance, a rather unpleasant tension that accompanies the appearance of two conflicting cognitions, be they thoughts or judgments. You're so full of sh Dandelion. But there's also a number of new characters to meet, like Jacques de Aldersberg, Grand Master of the Order, Kalkstein, a master alchemist, and Alvin, a young boy with unnatural abilities, who eventually plays a major role in the game's story, serving a similar role to the character Ciri, only with a wildly different and surprising outcome. But possibly one of the most important aspects of The Witcher's story is its focus on a player choice driven narrative. While most of the dialogue choices throughout the game simply provide more information on the world or the current situation, many can directly impact how future events unfold. This can range from simple things like paying off a guard versus fighting them to gain access to a building, to much more critical narrative forks, like deciding to side with the Scoia'tael or siding with the Order of the Flaming Rose. This choice-based system also greatly impacts the way characters will interact with the player, with characters being either more cooperative or dismissive depending on the established relationship. Oof, doubt that'll make Shani happy. This system helps to give the Witcher a significant amount of replay value, and remarkably, the choices that the player makes can even be carried forward into future entries in the series, similar to Bioware's Mass Effect franchise. For a game made in 2007, The Witcher offers a remarkably ambitious storyline, with some clever writing that does a respectful job of tapping into Sapowski's own style while also expanding upon established lore to make something completely different. But of course, that's only a fraction of the overall experience. The Witcher is, after all, a video game, and thus offers a wide range of gameplay mechanics to enhance the experience further. The Witcher is an RPG played from a third-person perspective, that pairs plenty of player-driven dialogue and decision-making with a complex combat and player upgrade system, inspired by the likes of past action RPG experiences. Players take control of Geralt from either an isometric camera perspective, or from a more modern, over-the-shoulder third-person viewpoint and embark on an extended adventure through several large environments, completing quests and ranking up their abilities. The main campaign is broken up into seven sections, each with several mainline and secondary quests to complete. The main quests typically pertain to Geralt's investigation of the Karamoran attack, but accomplishing this is no easy task, as the citizens of Vizima and its surrounding countryside have their own priorities and aren't willing to part with valuable information so easily. I will answer your ever so dull question if you bring me what I most desire. Most of the time, this involves running an errand for them or helping to resolve some sort of simple dispute. But seeing as the world is partially occupied by magic and monsters, things can get out of hand quickly, and Geralt will often need to hack and slash his way through all sorts of deadly enemies. Though, not every problem can be solved with a blade. Sometimes all it takes is the careful choice of words. Negotiation can be achieved in several different ways. Some NPCs will respond positively to receiving a particular gift. I never turn down good fizz tech. While others can be bartered with by offering an undisclosed amount of coin. Upstairs, my prince! But a few NPCs can be a bit trickier. I need you to help me with an autopsy. What? That's illegal. 
only offering certain dialogue choices at specific times of day. Shani. Mm hmm. I need your help with an autopsy. Okay, though, I'm no coroner. Or only fully trusting the player if they first show them an equipped signet ring. A ring of the eternal fire. Must be from the Reverend. Players can even challenge these characters to drinking contests in hopes of extracting important intel while they're drunk. Drinking with you is a f***ing treat. I'll show you something interesting, though I shouldn't. But what's so great about this system is that you're rarely forced to choose one particular method. There's often multiple paths to the same goal, with no true right answer. Even for the most important story-based decisions, the game does a great job of hiding the consequences of a player's choice until much later on, preventing any type of trial and error gameplay. This method greatly encourages players to make decisions that they themselves would make, rather than trying to guess what the intended choice should be. An absolute must when forming these types of choice-based narratives. But the quests aren't the only thing to experience in the world of The Witcher. The Temerian countryside feels very much like a living, breathing world, with lots of different people to meet, activities to participate in, and secrets to uncover. What really surprised me was the incredible level of detail that went into programming the game's scripted AI. Each NPC in the world has very specific instructions written in that dictate where they'll go throughout the course of the day. Blacksmiths, for example, will wake up in the morning, leave their house, and head to their shop. And then later, they could be found unwinding at a local pub or relaxing by the fire with friends. Children will play outside, guards will run patrols, and when it rains, all the characters will drop what they're doing and run for shelter, commenting on the sudden downpour. A wall of rain. It's not necessarily the same as the type of open world games we've become accustomed to, but coming from a completely new developer in 2007, this game world is pretty impressive. Which brings us to The Witcher's combat design. This is probably the area of the original Witcher that has aged the worst since its initial debut, as it feels remarkably disconnected and unusual when compared to the likes of other melee-focused action-adventure games. First off, in staying true with the books, Geralt has two main swords to choose from. The standard Steel Sword, that's intended for human-like opponents, and the Silver Sword, that is more powerful against monsters. Geralt can additionally equip a third melee weapon to his waist, though it's not all that necessary. When swords are drawn, players simply need to click on an enemy to initiate an attack, and can follow up with increasingly more powerful combos, by carefully timing their follow-up attacks whenever the mouse cursor changes its look. But clicking too early or too late will cancel the combo, resetting Geralt back to his default attack pattern. Players can also select between three different fight styles, fast, group, and strong, each necessary for specific types of enemy configurations. It's a pretty awkward system, even for the time it released, but once the player starts to upgrade their stats and unlock more powerful signs, it starts to become second nature. And Geralt's crazy flips and somersaults while he dodges, along with his often brutal coup de gras finisher moves, are still impressive to behold. Then of course there's Geralt's superhuman abilities, referred to as signs. Signs are powerful magical abilities that help to give the Witcher a fighting chance against his monstrous adversaries. There's Arg, that can send out a powerful blast of energy, knocking enemies back and sometimes stunning them for an instant finisher. Igni, that sends out a burst of flames from Geralt's fingertips. Yurden, that deploys spike-based traps on the ground. Quen, that offers some protection from attacks. And Axie, that can influence weak-minded opponents and turn them against their own allies. Each of these signs, when used, consumes the player's endurance, represented by a yellow bar under their health bar, thereby limiting their use during combat. But carefully timing them and using the right sign against the right enemy can drastically change the tide of a battle. However, these aren't the Witcher's only weapons at their disposal. Another important aspect of the game's combat is preparing for battles ahead of time, either by coating their swords in specialized oils, or by using alchemy to brew potions, both of which grant the player temporary enhancements. Like with signs, potions are balanced to prevent them from being too overpowered, and will increase the player's toxicity meter, with increased amounts of toxicity draining health and causing some slight image distortion on screen. Then of course, there's the character upgrade system. As players complete more quests and progress further in the game, they'll continue to earn increased amounts of XP, and will be rewarded with special talent points that can be used in the game's upgrade tree. 
This tree can be used to enhance nearly every aspect of Geralt's abilities, from his swordsmanship to the power of his signs, slowly transitioning him back into the legendary Witcher from Dandelion Songs. Overall, the original Witcher provides a remarkably deep and well thought out role playing experience. Its complex narrative, coupled with its dynamic, branching choice based mission design and solid pacing, resonated strongly with fans, and the game's initial release was met with solid reception across the board. It was generally praised for its beautiful visual presentation, story quality, and accompanying musical score, and was even given the award for Best RPG of the Year by both GameSpy and IGN. However, it didn't win everything, as Mass Effect had also released in that same year, offering some stiff competition. Still, to even be compared to the likes of Bioware with their very first foray into the world of game development is an incredible achievement, and helped to put CD Projekt on the map as not just a Polish localization studio, but a true competitor in the market, and their next project would expand that idea to an even larger audience. Following the success of The Witcher's first official video game debut, CD Projekt sought to expand their influence even further by means of their new platform, Good Old Games. The Good Old Games initiative was a direct response to the increase in DRM-protected PC games in the mid-2000s. CD Projekt, having experience dealing with simplifying software distribution in the past, saw this as an opportunity and established their own digital distribution platform, where every title made available for it would be completely DRM-free. Unsurprisingly, few publishers saw the advantage of such a platform, as it seemed counterproductive in their fight against the growing threat of piracy. But its goal of creating goodwill with the customers ultimately earned the trust of larger companies like Interplay and Ubisoft, encouraging other publishers to follow suit. This consumer-first mentality is a major component of CD Projekt's rise to fame, and will become even more important throughout the course of the 2010s. Meanwhile, back at CD Projekt Red, the development team spent most of 2008 working on an enhanced edition of their first game. While the game was lauded for its technical prowess, there was still plenty of room for improvement, including NPC and animation variety, along with a few localization issues that they had missed the first time around. CD Projekt also expressed interest in delivering their Witcher experience to console audiences, and agreed to a deal with Atari to have a small French studio called Widescreen Games work on a console port. But this decision quickly came back to haunt all those involved, as trying to rework a game built heavily around the PC-centric Aurora engine proved to be impossible with the allotted time and resources. After five months of development, it became obvious that progress on the port was not being made, and neither side was willing to accept blame for the holdup. According to the CEO at Widescreen Games, Olivier Masclef, their studio was being left in the dark regarding upcoming milestone dates and after not getting paid for a few months, they were forced to halt development. But CD Projekt's Owinski tells a different story, claiming that the developers at widescreen had been getting paid more than the developers within their own company. The project was ultimately cancelled in 2009, effectively bankrupting widescreen games, and their publisher, Atari, wasn't happy. So, to help mull things over, CD Projekt agreed to make Atari the publisher for the next big entry to the Witcher series. Having just narrowly avoided a costly conflict that could have easily bankrupted the entire studio, the team at CD Projekt Red could finally turn their attention to the future, and began experimenting with ideas for the next Witcher game. Right from the start, the developers knew that the Aurora engine, while a godsend to them in the past, had to be replaced. It was too rigid for their purposes, and it was ultimately the biggest reason that the console port failed so spectacularly. So, they tasked their programming team to construct prototypes for a brand new, in-house graphics engine architecture, referred to internally as the Red Engine. The Red Engine was tailor-made for The Witcher 2, and even saw most of its creation done throughout the course of the game's development. If the developers felt they needed something to improve the look of the game, then the programmers would find a way to make it a part of the engine. Lighting, for example, no longer required a tedious workaround, and was integrated seamlessly with a new dynamic shadow system. The game's models and artificial intelligence were also improved upon, with higher quality parallax mapping and increased layers of scripted actions to help make character behavior more believable. But some of the most important improvements were made to the combat design. Early prototypes of The Witcher 2 featured a combat design not too dissimilar from the combat in the original game, with the same timed point-and-click action and manually selected fighting stances. 
They even toyed around with the idea for quick time events in the hopes of making the action more intense. But this proved to take too much away from the gameplay experience and never made it into the final game. Other improvements were achieved by coordinating with third party toolmakers like Havoc, allowing for new ragdoll physics and destruction to really bring the world of The Witcher to life. But with all the effort being put into both an engine and a new game at the peak of a major economic downturn in the late 2000s, CD Projekt Red were forced to tone down their wild ambition, cutting out a major location intended to expand on the Scoia'tael storyline, along with major cuts to the final act. What's more, the planned follow-up to the sequel, known internally as just The Witcher 3, had to be shelved for the time being, as it was initially planned to release soon after. Finally, after only three years of development time, CD Projekt released their second game, The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings, a game that would greatly help to bolster their reputation in the industry. The Witcher 2 takes place directly after the events of the original game, with Geralt working in close collaboration with King Fultest of Temeria after having thwarted an assassination attempt against him. Uneasy about his near-death experience, Fultest demands that his illegitimate children of the Baroness Mavalette be returned to his palace in Vizima. But when the Baroness refuses, Fultest launches an aggressive assault on her stronghold, and asks Geralt to accompany him as a sort of good luck charm. But Geralt's presence proves insufficient as a deterrent, as a mysterious assassin manages to sneak by and cut Fultest down, and Geralt, being the only witness to the attack, is accused of being a Kingslayer. Desperate to prove his innocence, Geralt escapes from the castle dungeons with the help of the leader of the Tiberian Special Forces, Vernon Roach, and travels to a nearby riverside town called Fotsum in an effort to track down the real Kingslayer, and along the way, uncover the truth about his past. But just like with the original game, Geralt soon finds himself swept up in several other significant situations, including more racial unrest between the rebellious Scoia'tael and the fractured remnants of the Temerian military, along with a desperate land grab attempt between the kingdoms of Redania and Caudwin. To make matters worse, a dragon has been spotted terrorizing the Pontar Valley, the Nilfgaard are prepping for an all-out invasion, and the legendary Wild Hunt, whom Geralt had encountered at the end of the first game, continued to be an ever-present threat to the entirety of the world. It's an overall far more expansive and ambitious plot than the first game, pushing even more of Sapowski's deep lore into the player's core. But, with the help of a well-structured quest design and plenty of optional exposition provided by Geralt's many returning friends, the game's story is easily digestible to even the most novice Witcher fans. The Witcher 2 also sees the return of the original's choice-based narrative design, only with a slightly more cinematic flair to the camera work to help make each conversation feel more interesting. Players still need to think carefully about the choices that they make, as there are several different paths through the game depending on the alliances that are established. Choosing to side with Yorvith and his band of Scoia'tael warriors, for example, will push you to the city of Vergen to fight for the rights of non-humans, but this will subsequently hurt your relationship with Vernon Roach, and lock you out of the quest line at the Kedwin military camps. Roach, it's really important. Only you can help me. Now you want my help? I'll gladly return the favor. Uh, oh, wait. You did nothing for me. Like before, The Witcher 2 offers some fantastic replay potential, as there's a lot of different scenarios to explore, with no real right answer, and the overall feel and tone of the game's writing continues to feel consistent with that of The Witcher saga. The gameplay, on the other hand, marks a major turning point for the series, as it has been drastically revamped with more intuitive controls and mechanics designed to take full advantage of the planned console port. The general principle remains the same, Players control Geralt on an epic adventure filled with lots of narrative choices and monster slaying, but there's a slightly more claustrophobic feel to the world, as the level environments are noticeably smaller and less connected. Unlike The Witcher's Temerian Kingdom, where players could freely travel between different districts and venture around outside, The Witcher 2 offers more varied environments locked to particular chapters. The first chapter, for example, begins in a small swamp village called Flotsam with some village people to interact with, and plenty of monsters to slay in the nearby forest. But depending on the choices made throughout the course of this section, Geralt will then travel to one of two completely new environments, with no option to return. These sections are also the only areas that let players explore at their own pace, as both the prologue at La Follette Castle and the final chapter in the abandoned city of Loch Muin are more linear and scripted in their design, in an attempt to make the experience feel more cinematic. Thankfully, 
Because of the improvements made to the game's combat mechanics, this works strongly in favor of The Witcher 2. Rather than the unusual point-and-click combat from the first game, The Witcher 2 offers a more modernized, lock-on melee combat system, the same type of system that we see in most modern RPGs today. The three selectable combat styles have been retired, in favor of a much simpler, light and heavy attack that can be repeatedly pressed to perform combos without any specific timing requirement. Instead, that timing concept has been applied to the player's new blocking abilities that allows players to parry and perform a riposte, adding much-needed defensive options to the swordplay. Along with blocking, players can also dodge and roll more effectively, and the brutal finishers now trigger new locked camera angles, giving the takedowns a more cinematic flair. Even Geralt's powerful sign abilities have seen an update, with the Endurance Bar being replaced by a segmented Vigor Bar instead, and the Yurden sign being changed to stun targets directly. Other changes include a much larger selection of armor items to equip, a cleaner UI with radial dials to more easily swap between items during combat, and a completely overhauled player progression system that condenses the extensive list of upgrades from before into only four distinct categories, with some of the abilities being upgradable multiple times, and some that can be enhanced further using rare mutagen items. Together, The Witcher 2's updates to its gameplay mechanics, along with its more focused storyline, make it a significantly more accessible gaming experience. And because they had created the Red Engine specifically so that it would be easier to port over to the console, CD Projekt Red were quick to release a port of the game for the Xbox 360 only a year later, a move that would establish an even firmer foothold with its Western audiences. All in all, The Witcher 2 perfectly encapsulates the idea of less is more. Sure, its campaign is about a third of the length of the original game, and the level environments are much smaller when compared to the original game's Temeria, but the countless improvements that were made to the core mechanics, especially the combat and the branching narrative quests, make it an even more enjoyable experience. And the sentiment appears to have been shared throughout the industry, as The Witcher 2 received glowing reception from most major publications. Many praised the game for its gorgeous visual presentation, noting how well it translated over to the console platform, despite its hardware limitations, while others applauded the developers for updating the game's combat, stating that it offered a challenging but rewarding feel. However, not everyone shared these opinions. A few criticized the game for its lackluster ending, claiming that it felt unfinished, while others, like Rock Paper Shotgun, called CD Projekt Red out for their excessive sexual content, especially in regards to the game's female characters. But these complaints fell mostly on deaf ears, as the game continued to earn widespread praise and record sales numbers from the company, breaking 1 million units sold within the first year, a number that would continue to rise steadily as CD Projekt would press on with their biggest, most ambitious project yet. Now, before we move on, I think it's important to recognize some of the extraneous factors that likely contributed to The Witcher's success around this time period. Yes, CD Projekt made a fantastic sequel, and yes, it was more accessible thanks to its Xbox 360 release. But in the early 2010s, there was also a sharp spike in interest around low fantasy in general. Game of Thrones, the hit HBO show based on the books by George R.R. R. Martin, had just begun to air, and quickly began to dominate pop culture. Around the same time, Bethesda released their hugely ambitious new entry to the Elder Scrolls series, Skyrim only further pulling consumer interest back towards the same genre that The Witcher also occupied. But CD Projekt's next game would push the boundaries further than anyone could have anticipated, taking their dynamic storytelling to an entirely new level, and combining it with the sprawling open-world environments that Witcher fans have been dreaming of for decades. By 2013, CD Projekt confirmed what the end credit cutscene in Witcher 2 had already convinced fans, that a third entry to the popular Witcher series was on its way, and with each announcement video and E3 demonstration, the hype surrounding its development steadily grew to unprecedented levels. It was set to be the single greatest role-playing experience of a generation, and the epic conclusion to Geralt of Rivia's tale. CD Red, fully aware of the hype surrounding its new project, massively increased the size of the development team, and invested a sizable amount in updating the Red Engine to take full advantage of the then-new console platforms. The engine had already seen a slight update with the enhanced edition release of The Witcher 2, 
but Red Engine 3 was on a whole new level, built specifically around creating massive open-world environments. And this was key, as the developers were intent on creating the ultimate Witcher experience, fulfilling on their original promise to bring Sapkowski's world to life. But if they were going to pull this off, they were going to have to step outside their comfort zone, and deliver in ways they had never done before. One way they achieved this was by sending out a team of field researchers to the UK to film the various cliff sides of Scotland, capturing close-up imagery of things like forest floors and tree bark to help replicate their appearance in the Red Engine as closely as possible. They also continued to refine the engine itself with more advanced capabilities, increasing the number of particle effects, incorporating new volumetric lighting, and programming in new dynamic weather systems, only further adding to the game world's realism. When recording dialogue for the game's ambitious lineup of characters, the developers took advantage of the constant hype surrounding the Game of Thrones series, and tapped Charles Dance, the actor that played the ruthless Tywin Lannister, to play a somewhat similar role as the leader of the Nilfgaardian Empire. I had forgotten how insolent you can be. What's even more impressive is that CD Projekt took the massive $80 million budget for the game's development upon themselves, and opted to self-publish the project, using support from their extremely loyal fanbase and the revenue from their increasingly more popular GOG platform to aid in covering the cost. It was a risky move, one that most developers would never think to take without having other projects in the pipeline to make ends meet if things fell apart. But CD Projekt were confident in their abilities, and pressed forward anyway. They did, however, run into a few snags throughout the course of development. The game was initially meant to release as early as 2013, but they were ultimately forced to postpone due to a plethora of game-breaking bugs and various other forms of instability. This soon became a common trend for those following The Witcher 3's development, as CD Projekt Red were forced to delay the game once again from 2014 into early 2015. But Owinski reassured the fanbase that the wait would be worth it, stating that it was a really tough decision to push back The Witcher 3, but gamers don't care about buggy games shipped on time, taking a firm stance against rushing out games before they're finished. Finally, after years of wild anticipation and several heartbreaking delays, the game was ready, and CD Projekt Red unleashed The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt for the PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One in May of 2015. The Witcher 3 is the conclusion to the tale of the legendary White Wolf of Rivia. Geralt, having finally recovered his memory by the end of The Witcher 2, has now made it his sole mission to locate his adopted daughter Ciri, who helped to rescue him from certain death prior to the events of the first game. Ciri, a young princess turned Witcher in training, possesses an extraordinary amount of power, and plays a pivotal role throughout the course of the books. And with Geralt now finally remembering that he's been bonded to her through destiny, he sets off to find her and bring her home to Kaer Morin. But Geralt isn't the only one tracking her down, as a group of spectral riders known as the Wild Hunt are also on the prowl for the Lady of Time and Space, and intend to use her power to open an interdimensional portal and take over the world. As always, Geralt's journey is complicated further, as the weakened northern realms are now being invaded by the Nilfgaardian Empire and the racial unrest in the world's largest city of Novigrad has reached a breaking point, with the events at Lac Muin encouraging even stronger distrust of the sorceresses living among them. It's the most expansive and story-rich entry in the Witcher trilogy, and features an unprecedented amount of characters to interact with, including all the fan favorites, some newcomers, and even a few classics finally making their video game debut, like Geralt's original main love interest, Yennefer, and the Emperor of Nilfgaard, Amir. The Witcher 3 also continues to build upon the series' popular branching narrative design, adding in even more dynamic choices that will not only impact how characters react to the player, but even transform the game world itself, with the consequences of the player's choices gradually becoming more apparent with each passing day. But one of The Witcher 3's strongest qualities is in how it handles each individual quest. To avoid what CD Projekt considered to be pitfalls of games like Skyrim, they specifically focus on enriching all the game's quests, ensuring that every seemingly mindless chore, contract, and objective offered something worthwhile to the player, from the rewards given to the player for completing them to the actual value in the story. This ensures that every NPC is worth talking to, as they could potentially offer their own unique adventure to experience, often far removed from the main plot. And this aspect is crucial in providing that quintessential Monster Hunter for Hire feel, something that past games may have attempted, but The Witcher 3 excels at. Red 
So what exactly was changed that allows this new game to more properly realize the atmosphere Sapowski was trying to convey? Mostly, it's the new open world environments. While The Witcher 1, and to some extent The Witcher 2, offered more open-ended areas to explore, they were still limited frequently by load screens and a severe lack of variety. Players would spend more than half the game running back and forth across city streets, helping the village people out with their various murder mysteries. But witchers are more accustomed to being out in the wilderness, roaming from town to town, taking on contracts for coin and meditating out in the woods. And with a new focus on wide open spaces, The Witcher 3 fits perfectly into this fantasy. The game starts players off in a small rural community called White Orchard, where a large griffin serves to level gate players as they learn the ropes of the game's many mechanics. But upon arriving in Velen, the game opens up considerably, with vast countryside composed of marshlands, rolling wheat fields, and dense medieval cities. What's more, players are not given any explicit instruction into where they're supposed to go, with only some basic suggestions on where they can start their search for Ciri. What's more, these beautiful vistas aren't just for show. Every inch of the game's environments feel alive, with an evolved version of the great AI tech from previous games now being applied to things like creatures and monsters, and a more advanced dynamic time of day and weather system that controls the cloud patterns, wind speed, and even the lunar cycle. To help traverse these wide-reaching new lands, The Witcher 3 adds in a bunch of new methods for traversal, chief among them being Geralt's trusty steed Roach, who can be called upon at a moment's notice by whistling. Roach can even be equipped with saddlebags to expand the player's inventory, a saddle to increase her stamina, winders to keep her from getting scared, and even trophies from slain monsters to show off a recent victory. When faced with oceans impassable by horseback, Geralt can either swim or commandeer small sailboats, which become even more important when traversing across the Isles of Skellige. There's even a new fast travel mechanic, allowing players to interact with road signs and instantly teleport to a previously discovered location. These locations, especially the bigger villages and towns, offer a wide range of activities to experience. From drinking, to fight clubs, to sex and card games, there's a lot to see and do. But probably one of the most exciting activities has to be the refined monster hunting contracts. These contracts, while present in the past two games, are much more expansive this time around, letting players immerse themselves in the fantasy of hunting down a dangerous mythological beast. Typically, when a player finds a notice board posting for a monster, there's some vague hint about what could be causing the commotion, like a rough description of the creature from a witness, and it's up to the player to uncover the truth, using their new Witcher senses to observe crime scenes and gather clues, and then cross-checking those clues with information in the bestiary. After identifying the creature, the player can then prepare for battle and craft the necessary potions and oils prior to luring it in. It's an extremely well done part of the game, and allows players to really familiarize themselves with the different enemies that the game has to offer, and provides a nice break from having to find frying pans for old ladies. Another great new activity is treasure hunting, more specifically hunting down the diagrams to the rare and powerful witcher armor. These diagrams are hidden all over the game, and are required in order to craft some of the coolest looking armor sets. Though it's no easy task, as they're sometimes guarded by some powerful enemies, and will require a significant amount of rare resources to craft. And that's assuming that the player manages to successfully find the right armorer and blacksmith to take on the job. Finally, there's Gwent. Gwent is a card game, based heavily on the many characters and creatures of the Witcher's lore. The rules are simple. Players take turns placing down cards to increase their point total, and the player with the most points at the end of a round wins. The catch is that players are only given a total of 10 cards by default to use throughout the entire game, so they need to carefully choose when to play certain cards to maximize their score and best their opponent. It can get very complex, especially when you start getting into talking about the different deck types, weather cards, and the like. But the general takeaway here is that the minigame is so addictive that it's easy to get lost challenging every barkeep across the game world and completely neglecting your lost Destiny daughter. In fact, the minigame turned out to be so popular among fans that CD Projekt even sold real card decks for fans to enjoy at first, and would later develop a standalone Gwent game, with a few tweaks to make it more competitive. With Gwent, treasure hunting, lots of different quest lines and monster contracts, there's a lot to see and do throughout The Witcher 3's wide-reaching landmasses. But the big map isn't the only thing that's changed. The Witcher 3 also sees some important updates to its combat mechanics as well. Using The Witcher 2 as a jumping-off point, The Witcher 3's combat is built to be more streamlined and fluid, 
with a wider camera view, and more animations built in to help Geralt attack enemies around him regardless of his starting position. The controls remain mostly the same, with designated keys for light attacks, heavy attacks, and blocking, but parrying has been reworked with more of a risk-reward mentality, requiring players to tap the block key right as an enemy's health bar glows to perform a counterattack. Other changes include faster dodging, a more responsive target system, and the removal of cinematic takedowns, opting for integrated critical kills instead. The game's signs have also seen another update, this time reconfiguring the Yurden sign to create an area of effect that slows down hostiles caught within. Additionally, the Axie sign no longer turns enemies against each other by default, and instead is used to stun enemies. Signs can also be upgraded to behave completely differently, like turning Igni into a sort of flamethrower, letting players fine-tune them to fit their playstyle. The game's alchemy system was also changed, making it so potions only need to be crafted once, and simply meditating will automatically use common resources to refill any previously crafted potions or oils. This encourages players to experiment more with the many different potions and oils found in the game, an aspect of the past two games that, while useful on occasion, was easy to overlook. As always, players can expect a robust list of player upgrades as well, with four distinct categories based on Geralt's various core abilities. But instead of allowing players to use all these upgrades at once, The Witcher 3 forces players to choose only a few, and stacking similar colored upgrades together in the same column will help to boost their effectiveness, alongside a similar system for the mutagens. Other changes introduced in the game include simplified inventory screens, weapon and armor durability, a new resource crafting menu, and new player gadgets, like a crossbow, that drop flying monsters out of the sky. Overall, The Witcher 3 goes well out of its way to deliver the absolute ultimate Witcher experience. This is a game that was very much made for fans by fans, and that dedication quickly paid off, as the game achieved incredibly high reviews from almost every single major outlet, with some even claiming it to be one of the greatest video games of all time. The game went on to win many Game of the Year awards in 2015, beating out other high-profile titles from that year including Bloodborne, Fallout 4, and Metal Gear Solid 5. Sales also far exceeded expectations, with well over 1.5 million pre-orders placed before the game was even finished, and upwards of over 30 million units having been sold up to this date. But before players could even digest it all, CD Projekt Red were already hard at work adding more content to the game, including constant technical improvements, bug fixes, and a long list of new features, including the return of the barbershop from The Witcher 2, a storage chest to stow excess gear, and of course, the first of two planned expansions to the game's campaign. The first expansion, titled The Hearts of Stone, released back in October of 2015, and adds a new series of quests to experience in the northeastern edge of the Velen map. In this quest, Geralt accepts a contract from a nobleman, Von Everick, to kill a beast in a nearby sewer system. But after discovering this to be a trick, Geralt is captured and forced to make a deal with a mysterious man in exchange for three impossible to fulfill wishes. It's a fantastic addition to the game's narrative, and even features some nice appearances from old classics like the Medic Shani. But at the same time, it doesn't add too much new to the game either, with only a few new enemy types and a new upgrade system for things like swords and armor runes. About a year later, CD Projekt Red released their second and final expansion for The Witcher 3, an expansion so big and full of new content that it could probably serve as its own standalone release. The expansion, titled Blood and Wine, follows Geralt's journey to the Kingdom of Tucson, as he investigates a mysterious murder mystery. Unlike the first expansion, Blood and Wine introduces a massive new environment to explore, complete with a ton of new weapons, armor, some new enemies, and most notable of all, a homestead called Corvo Bianco, that can be upgraded with new places to display weapons, armor, and grow helpful resources. It's a way more ambitious addition to the game, and also provides an ultimate conclusion to Geralt's adventures, making any future titles starring the character even more unlikely. Like with the base game, the fan and critical reception for these expansions was incredibly positive, with many praising it for its great quest design and well-implemented new features. 
It also set a new precedent for video game expansions, and is the subject of frequent comparisons when considering what exactly a video game expansion should be. Collectively, The Witcher 3 is considered to be a masterpiece. CD Projekt's magnum opus, and many began to recognize the development studio as one of the absolute best in the entire industry. But the sentiment would be short-lived, as the studio finally would part ways with their beloved Witcher trilogy, and move on to a completely new IP. Back in 2012, prior to The Witcher 3's formal announcement, CD Projekt unveiled a brand new passion project that for the first time was not related to The Witcher series at all. It instead was based on an old tabletop board game called Cyberpunk, and would offer a new challenge for the studio as they attempted to try on a new style and new perspective. The project eventually went quiet as hype for The Witcher 3 began to emerge and boil over, and as the years went on, many feared CD Projekt had thrown the idea out. But finally, in 2018, Cyberpunk was back in the headlines, with a new trailer and a follow-up gameplay reveal that demonstrated a significant departure from their past work. The game was set to be completely first-person, with an increased focus on using firearms and special hacking abilities, and the narrative would be structured even more strongly around player choice, ensuring that no two players had the same gameplay experience. By the time of the reveal, the development team at CD Projekt Red had been completely engulfed by their work on Cyberpunk, with staff size again seeing a huge increase, and major talent like Keanu Reeves being signed on to play critical roles in the campaign. And after a number of disappointing delays, CD Projekt Red finally released their fourth and most recent game, Cyberpunk 2077. But unlike The Witcher 3, Cyberpunk wasn't met with resounding praise. In fact, it was met with a lot of controversy, with many players on older consoles like the PS4 suffering from an insurmountable amount of technical issues. So despite its positive reviews from industry professionals, Cyberpunk had left an unfamiliar stain on CD Projekt's reputation, and at least for the next year or so, fixing the game and cleaning it up will likely be their bigger focus. Overall, the Witcher video game franchise has underwent an incredible journey. What started as a niche fantasy story from Poland has been transformed into one of the biggest, most recognizable role-playing video games in recent history. And it's forever changed the way developers look at creating open-world experiences. The series is the perfect example of both graphical and gameplay evolution, with The Witcher 1 showing what's capable when immense passion is met with technical and monetary limitation, the Witcher 2 being a sort of acknowledgement of poor gameplay mechanics and an attempt to fix them, and The Witcher 3 being the ultimate refined package, fully delivering on the promises that the studio had always sought to deliver. The game series has been so successful even that Netflix has been working on their own exclusive television show, with season 2 set to release sometime later this year. But now, with Geralt's story having been officially concluded in both the games and the books, what's really left for the series other than the show? There have been some murmurs of a new game, centered around Geralt's adopted daughter Ciri, which seems like the logical next step considering she was playable at some points in The Witcher 3. So it'll be interesting to see how fans will react to a Witcher game that doesn't star its most popular character. But what do you guys think? Which Witcher game was your favorite, and where do you think the series should go next? Let me know in the comments section! If these games interest you in any way and you want to give them a try, be sure to check out the links I provided in the description. If you act fast, you can get the original Witcher game completely free through the GOG Galaxy app right now. Consider it a gift for making it this far in the video. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos posted every week.